good evening and very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. I'm Ian Golden, for those of you that don't know me, the director. And it's a huge pleasure this evening to be introducing a conversation about the relationship between individual and collective decision making, uh, the global commons, uh, our responsibilities and the responsibilities of other actors uh, to ensure a better world. Well, this arises um, out of a new research program which the Oxford Martin School uh, has commissioned. We are now doing annual thematic uh, calls for uh, research in addition to the marriages and other things that we create uh, of uh, academics together with potential funders uh, and ad hoc programs. Uh, and this was an extremely competitive process. Uh, this was the first time uh, we had done a thematic research program uh, and we felt that this issue uh, of the relationship between individual and collective decision making, this issue regarding uh, the commons, uh, which we will describe to you, uh, is one which is absolutely central to the way that the 21st century is likely to evolve, whether this will be our best century uh, or our worst will depend on our ability uh, in no small part to think through and effectively manage this issue. So it was our priority in terms of research themes. It really is something that's emerged out of the 34 previous research themes that we've uh, funded as a key issue. Uh, we had a call and uh, this evening what you'll hear from is the winners. Uh, so this is the best. Uh, that we received. I'm sorry to anyone in the audience that didn't uh, make the cut. Uh, that wasn't necessarily because you're not the best, but in this respect, uh, we felt these were even better uh, than the others. So this is really what we are very excited about in terms of new thinking uh, across the board. And I'm really delighted by everyone that applied uh, for this, uh, but particularly the work that's already been put into. This program has been going, uh, most of these groups, I think, about a year. Six months. Six months, yep. So it's very new. Uh, you're seeing the beginnings of a work program, uh, not the end. Uh, they'll run from between, <coughs> between two and five years. Uh, so come back uh, for fuller results in the future. Look at our website. But this is very much the thinking that formed this. So this evening, um, we're going to be joined by Professor Richard Bailey. He's the co-director of the program on sustainable oceans. Uh, professor, associate professor in the School of Geography uh, at Oxford and also involved with INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking uh, in the Oxford Martin School and the Oxford Biodiversity Institute. Um, Nick Eyre, who's the co-director of the program of Integrating Renewable en Energy, uh, which is in the Environmental Change Institute. He's been engaged in many, many different areas of work in Oxford and elsewhere on energy systems. Uh, Professor Cameron Hepburn, who's the Director of the Economics of Sustainability Program in the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Mount School, uh, and is also in the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment. And uh, Professor Angela McCain, who is the Co-Director of the Institute of Emerging Infections in the Oxford Martin School, uh, and now of our new program on collective responsibility uh, for infectious diseases, is Professor of Mathematical Biology, uh, and Senior Research Fellow at All Souls College. So we, what we're going to do first is briefly describe each of these programs uh, and then talk a little bit about what Global Commons issues are, have a conversation amongst us regarding what some of the common themes are, and then uh, open it up to you uh, to um, ask questions and engage in the conversation. So let's begin with a description of each of these um, themes, uh, beginning with uh, Angela McLean. Thank you, Ian. Um, so I'm co-director, along with two other co-directors, of this thing called uh, a programme in collective responsibility for infectious disease. And the other co-directors are Julian Savalescu, who is a philosopher, and Mark Harrison, who's a historian of science. And our interest is, um, to what extent would it be possible to persuade people to behave better? in the way we, we act when it comes, comes to the control of infectious disease because, because of their very nature, uh, what one of us does when we are infectious has big implications for the people around us who we might infect. 
And it's not only to do with um, what you do when you're infectious, it's all also to do with your behaviours, to do with controlling your own infection. Uh, so, for example, we're very interested in questions about the use and the abuse of antibiotics, uh, and we're very interested in questions about uh, people who refuse vaccines. And in both those cases, uh, we argue that really what's going on there is that there's a common pool of resource and it is actually subject to a tragedy of the commons. So Cameron's going to go into this in, in more detail, but in order to be a common pool resource, you have to have something uh, where it's rather difficult to exclude other people from using it, and that when one person uses it, it, it makes it less available to others. So we'd argue that the existence of working antibiotics is a common pool resource. It's actually quite difficult to stop people from abusing um, antibiotics, and if one person abuses antibiotics and drives the evolution of antibiotic resistance, uh, they become less available to everybody else. And that means that that's a question that is really open to a whole lot of other thinking that has been developed quite deeply uh, in the management of more traditional common pool resources. Uh, I'll give one other example before handing on. Again, we would argue that the existence of herd immunity in a population, so that's the property whereby if enough people are immune, and it doesn't have to be everybody, if enough people are immune, it's not possible for infectious <coughs> disease to propagate. And this is the principle by which we control childhood infectious diseases through vaccination. Again, we'd argue that that's a common pool resource. It's difficult to exclude people in the sense that we don't like to force people to be vaccinated. But at the end of the day, the community can really only support uh, effectively a fixed number of people who are not vaccinated. So if one person refuses vaccination, that effectively has costs for everybody else. Um, and again, we think that bringing ideas uh, that, that my colleagues are going to uh, refer to more widely uh, from the management of common pool resources into these questions about managing infectious disease, um, we hope will allow us to think in new ways uh, about infectious disease control. Thanks, Angela. Uh, Richard. Thank you. Um, so, our project is about the global oceans, um, again, another common pool resource. Um, my colleagues, my co directors, are Alex Rogers in the zoology department, who's a marine scientist, and Catherine Reguel, who's in the law department. Here. Now, any of you who came to my, uh, my, mm -hmm. if you came to my uh, talk a few weeks ago, will have heard me go on and on about how important the oceans are. So, I'm going to go on and on about how important the oceans are yeah. just, just for a moment. Okay, so the oceans are fundamentally important to lots of aspects of life on, on Earth. They absorb a huge amount of CO2, so uh, something like 30% of the CO2 that we produce goes into the oceans. Um, so more than 90% of the excess heat we produce is going into the oceans, so they have a massive effect in terms of regulating climate. Um, something like 200 million people depend for their livelihoods on the ocean. Uh, more than uh, uh, 2 million people get more than 20% of the protein in their diet from the ocean. Um, there's lots of reasons why, why a healthy ocean is fundamentally important to life on Earth. Life on Earth. What could be better? <clears throat> My word. All right, one second. Right. <laughs> I'm kind of scaring myself a little bit. Um, so, our, our project is, is about how to manage this global resource that's, fun that's so fundamentally important to lots of aspects of our life. It's a very difficult resource to manage for a number of reasons. It's difficult because of the scale and complexity of the oceans. Um, it's difficult because the legal and institutional um, instruments aren't really complete. They don't really do a good enough job for us. Um, the laws that we do have aren't really enacted well enough. Uh, we don't really know, know how to manage these, these resources. It's a very difficult system to predict the cause and effect type outcomes. So we really need a whole range of better tools. We need to better understand the nature of the system, we need to define the system better. Once we understand how to manage it, we then need a better legal set of instruments to implement these, these, uh, these management practices we have. So our project is a, is a multifaceted one. Uh, we have uh, Catherine and her team looking at legal aspects. They're working um, alongside the uh, UN and other organizations. We're, we're mapping biodiversity uh, globally. We're bringing together lots of different data sets to try and form a baseline to understand where we stand at the moment. 
Um, we're looking at uh, how to manage. One of, the, one of the big ways we interact with, glo with the global ocean ecosystem is through fishing. We're, we're eating parts of the ecosystem selectively and having a significant effect on it. So how do we manage those fisheries uh, effectively, sustainably? Uh, how can we enforce rules? So we're looking at things like satellite enforcement. Perhaps how can we monitor what's happening in the oceans? And then if we have a better legal framework, how can we apply the rules to the people we know are breaking those rules? Um, and they're also looking at a whole range of new industries, things like marine mining, which has the potential to be uh, enormously important economically, but also enormously destructive ecologically. So how do we, how do we understand the effect that might have? How do we pr pr produce guidelines and, and rules that, that will uh, help us to maintain that in a sustainable way? Thank you, Richard. Nick. Thanks, Ian. So uh, I'm here representing the uh, Oxford Martin Programme on Integrating Renewable Energy, of which I'm one of the co-directors, and the other is Malcolm McCulloch uh, from the Department of Engineering Science, who's sitting at the front there. Um, so the starting point for our um, programme is the, uh, the idea that renewable energy is getting cheaper um, and is likely to be cost-effective in delivering energy services. Uh, in many parts of the world in quite quickly. Indeed, it already is in many places. Um, so whilst in a, in a sense that's a, a good news story, what it does is change, potentially change the nature of our, globe, of our energy systems quite quickly, quicker than they've changed uh, historically since the Industrial Revolution. And in one particular way, we're moving away from using stocks of energy accumulated in fossil fuels over millions of years to flows of natural energy. So those have some important different uh, attributes. Uh, clearly, um, natural energy is free. That doesn't mean the capital to capture it and move it about is free, uh, but the energy itself is free, unlike um, fossil fuels. Uh, but it also means that the resources are much more distributed, uh, both in space and in time. So uh, in many ways, fossil fuel technologies were the, 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 the ultimate modernism, the cathedrals of the Industrial Revolution. One thinks of giant power stations. If we're moving to natural flows and capturing those, that's a very different, uh, th those have those, some very different properties. So the markets will need to be very different, in essence, because we're using um, fuels that have zero marginal costs. We're, they're essentially an infrastructure system, not a commodity, and we're trying to use commodity markets at the moment to uh, manage our, our energy systems. But they do introduce the problem that they don't have um, as much storage. Fossil fuels, um, whatever we think of them, um, are great for storing energy. Piles of coal, tanks of oil, really cheap. Now, we know in principle what the solutions to the, this problem are. We can have more flexible generation systems. We can move our demand flexibly. We can introduce new storage systems, and some of those, like uh, lithium-ion batteries, are already getting fairly cost-effective in some applications. Uh, or we can interconnect um, to other energy systems. But that combination of um, issues, um, of, of, of solutions, uh, there is really no good theory about which of those w will make the largest contribution, how they should combine, or how we m move through the transition process of, 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 of installing them. So I think you can see that that is um, uh, clearly a technical problem, which is why we have engineers involved. Um, it's also an economic problem about how to redesign markets, which is why we've got economists of whom Cameron is one involved in the program. But there are also some pretty difficult social and governance issues to think through because we're, uh, we're operating at different scales from historically, uh, from, from energy systems historically. And so it is really a fundamentally uh, interdisciplinary problem, which is why it hasn't been addressed very well before and why it's, I think, uh, the right sort of problem for the Martin School to address. Thanks, Nick. Um, Cameron. Thank you, Ian. Um, so I'm the co-director of uh, the Oxford Martin Net Zero Carbon Investment Initiative. I'm an economist, uh, although with a background in engineering and law. My co-director is Miles Allen, who is a physicist and 
the team doing all the work it consists of Richard Miller, who is a physicist. <laughs> um, uh, and our program really asks the question, in a world where we know we need to get to net zero emissions across the entire economy, what's the role of finance? And it was triggered partly by the public and vociferous and kind of fairly emotive discussions about divestment. Should Oxford sell all of its holdings in oil, coal and gas companies? Should other universities do the same thing? And on the one hand, obviously, you know, if, 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 if everyone did that tomorrow and no one owned these things and ran them, then the whole economy would uh, run out of gas, literally, and power and the coal and the rest of it. Uh, and these lights would go off. But on the other hand, eventually, we do need to get out of these um, fuels altogether. So what's the right way, scientifically, economically, for finance to engage with this big challenge? And so what we've been doing is um, working, well, we, we had a meeting here to kind of call for evidence. We had a two-day meeting at Harvard where we got a whole lot of evidence from the activists through to the endowment managers through to other finance uh, people, practitioners, economists, etc. And uh, we have, we're focusing our efforts on thinking about disclosure of carbon risks to investors, including university endowments and others, so that they can make uh, their own decisions about whether to disinvest, uh, whether to invest in renewables, on what time frame they should do it, and what the right response is. Because, of course, part of, part of the right response is, is an ethical issue, and while I have done some philosophy, we don't have a philosopher on the team, but um, we have talked to a lot of philosophers. The, so where, where, we're, where we're moving very practically is that, uh, and this goes to the point of um, common challenges, is that the G20 group of nations has a, a body called the Financial Stability Board, which is chaired by Mark Carney, who is the Bank of England, the Governor of the Bank of England. That board has uh, partly in response, uh, part, partly influenced, I should say, by certain Oxford uh, professors decided to launch a voluntary industry-led effort to work out what appropriate disclosure would be about climate change risks on the balance sheet of various companies, whether it's the big oil, the big coal, or other companies who might be affected by the physical impacts of climate change. <clears throat> and they have launched a, a process um, chaired by Mike Bloomberg uh, it's done its phase one report into which we um, contributed and we're currently working with them on the phase two report, which is trying to uh, align upon a set of principles, and we've already published a, a draft working set of principles for disclosure, the set of principles that companies around the world would be asked to oblige by in terms of disclosing what how they're going to get to net zero and what does their business look like when we're in a world where there's no emissions. Now, for some companies, that's easy. For other companies, that's very hard to answer that question. What is my business model if you're a coal miner uh, in a world where there's no emissions? And uh, I could um, perhaps we'll go on a little bit more in discussion, but there are various answers and we're helping these various companies to explore those answers within the confines and boundaries of the science and the economics. Great. Thanks, uh, Cameron. So four very exciting, um, very important issues, infectious diseases, oceans, energy systems, and climate change uh, that we're trying to grapple. Obviously, there are many other uh, commons issues that uh, were proposed and that we could have grappled with, but we think that by uh, trying to think these through in very interdisciplinary ways, uh, we'll try and develop some general principles uh, which will help us uh, think about this class of problems. Now, to, uh, to give us a brief introduction to what this particular, what all these things have in common, uh, why do we put these all together as a, uh, a shared uh, research program, and what are the possible thematic and intellectual areas that we're trying to leverage, I'm going to ask Cameron, who's um, written extensively about this, to give us a five-minute tutorial uh, on global commons. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> I, I should start by saying I think the reason I'm the one giving this tutorial is because I was not in a meeting when it was, 
and that takes me to the first point that is shared across these problems, which is the incentive to free ride uh, 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 and the problem of external effects or externalities, as economists refer to them. So all problems, whether it's infectious diseases, oceans, energy systems or climate, uh, are problems where the actions of one person impose either costs or benefits, if you're vaccinating yourself, upon others, and those costs or benefits are not priced and not taken account of by some market institution. So unless you have some additional solution in play, you're not going to get the right forms of behaviour. You'll get too much of the bad activity, whether it's pollution or overfishing, and too little of the good activity. So that's a fairly standard feature of many problems, but it's writ large with these global commons problems. The next thing to say, as I think Angela alluded to, is that um, a, a common... Uh, a common pool resource which can exist at a very local level as well as an international level. It's a resource that is difficult to exclude people from uh, and where um, someone taking it means that someone else can't take from that resource. So the word is it's rivalrous, so it's a rival resource. So uh, if I tell you something uh, that's interesting, hopefully it doesn't leave my brain as well. That's an information is non-rival, although increasingly I'm wondering about the <laughs> Uh, but, but if you take my um, dinner, then I'm not going to eat it. Uh, it's certainly not in regurgitated form, but not in the, not in the original form. So, so common pool resources are both rivalrous and they're, they're not difficult to exclude others from, from using them. And that gives rise to both this free rider type problem, it gives rise to these externalities, and it, uh, you can categorise them in, in other ways. One, form of categorization which I find useful is a three-part categorization. So is the problem one which can be solved by a single best effort of one actor? So an asteroid coming to hit the Earth uh, is such a problem. Uh, if I go and destroy the asteroid, I save my own life, but I save many other people's lives at the same time. So I'm imposing external positive effects on others which I'm not rewarded by. But in the case of an asteroid coming at Earth, because the costs imposed on any one nation state, such as the US, are so great, you can be fairly confident that one actor will take a single best effort, take out the asteroid, and that sort of commons problem is perhaps a little easier to address, provided it's clear who that key actor ought to be. This is one type. A second type, uh, and then I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> a second type is the... Um, the weakest link type of problem. So this is a problem where, a commons problem where you more or less need everyone to behave for it to, to be solved. And I think to some degree, immunization is a, a type of weakest link problem. You may not need absolutely everyone, but you need a lot of actors all to be behaving well to eliminate the downside risk. And then a third type of commons problem is a cumulative effort or a total effort commons problem where um, what you really need is, you don't, you don't necessarily need just one actor or everybody, but you need enough actors to take enough action that it gets you over a, a hurdle. And, and arguably, uh, climate change is one of these sorts of problems because if enough actors take enough effort to pull down the costs of clean energy, then everyone else, it'll just be in everyone else's interest to adopt them. And so they don't actually, you don't, don't have a problem to solve anymore. Um, so that, that's the features of these commons problems, which are shared by all of them, um, a taxonomy. And then I think to kind of start the rest of the discussion, uh, economists and others, uh, Lynn Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for this in this area, then go on to argue about whether the right solution is to use the coercive power of the state in the national boundary. Of course, we don't have a, uh, you know, an international government, so global commons problems become particularly dif difficult or whether these problems can be solved bottom-up by a coalition or a community type of solution. And I suspect just leaving that hanging will lead to some good yeah. discussion. Great. Thanks. That was um, excellent. Uh, so let's go through some of these um, issues and think about uh, how these ideas might be helpful uh, in allowing us to think about them uh, and where we'll place them in, in um, sort of categorization that uh, Cameron's um, outlined. Angela, I mean, maybe you, you know, you've been working on these issues, uh, I guess, most of your career. Now you've been sort of joined into a, 
this Commons program. I'd be interested to know, you know, how you feel uh, it might have uh, been helpful. Has it changed any of your thinking about the way you do it? Um, you know, what elements in what you're doing think really make sense in this sort of framework? Right, thank you. So when I first came to this, which was before this program uh, was, was, was advertised, I was sent by a college colleague uh, to read Eleanor Ostrom's um, article in, in the sort of standard dictionary of economics. Uh, and uh, I was really, really struck by her lists of the things that have to be in place uh, in order for uh, good governance of common pool resources to grow up. And above all, the one that says, really, these things seem to work best uh, when there are well-defined boundaries for, for wh where are the edges of the resource. And, and that's resonated in my mind for a long time because, of course, for infectious disease, it's really extremely difficult uh, to, to define hard boundaries. Um, nevertheless, and then for, so for a long time, I thought, oh, well, I mean, if the, um, if the only boundary is, you know, one planet, uh, that's actually not, a, not I, I'm not sure that's going to be terribly helpful. And then more recently, I've been thinking about this, and, and actually, of course, although infections do spread very well, globally. The fact is that nevertheless the great majority of our risk is local. And I think that raises questions for uh, building coalitions uh, around where those risks lie. So any of us who are parents know full well how infectious disease comes into your home and it comes by your children's school. <laughs> Um, and, and, I, and I think that, 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 that seriously, there, that there are ways of thinking about, um, uh, about, about layers of organisation uh, that can get around this issue of, of if, is it just a global problem? Um, that's, will that do for a start? Yeah, yeah, you've got a few more minutes if you want to say a bit more, but that, that's fine. Um, Richard, do you want to sort of answer the same question in your context? Sure, thanks. Um, so I think... If you, if you look up in any textbook a definition of a commons problem, one of the first things you'll see is fishing, and fishing in a lake, or you'll see grazing on a, on a commons or something like this. And so being interested in the oceans and the management of, you know, sustainable management of resources, uh, fisheries kind of fits very naturally into this. Um, it's quite inter I think another interesting aspect of this is the time dependence in it. If we you just wanna, do you want to say something about why fishing is a, a common a common resource. Sure. No. I'll, I'll, yes, I'll come. Uh, okay. I'll come to that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's there's a, there's a time. As I say, there's a time dependence in this. It, maybe it didn't used to be a common pool resource. If we go back a few thousand years ago, where the maximum pressure we could exert on the ocean ecosystem was um, people in canoes fishing for subsistence. They couldn't go far from um, from the coast. Uh, they didn't exert a great fishing pressure. They couldn't take up many a large proportion of the fish available to them. So really, it wasn't really a common pool uh, resource in that sense. It wasn't subtractable. So if I take a fish, it doesn't matter because there's plenty more, so someone else can go and take a fish as well. So it's effectively non-subtractable. As technology improved, and in, particularly into the 60s and 70s and, and the 80s and the 90s, and this, is, this has shown, there's lots and lots of studies that have shown this, we have the potential then to really significantly impact, to, as I was saying before, to eat parts of the, the ecosystem. And that has a massive effect, knock-on knock on effect to different parts of the ecosystem, but it becomes a subtractable resource. So over time, it's become a commons problem. And now we have such good technology, good in inverted commas, um, such efficient ways of, of, of catching uh, these, these poor, defenseless little creatures, um, that, that it really is a, a huge commons problem now. Um, so I think that... It's a common, the oceans are a commons problem in terms of extraction of living material. They're also, also a commons problem. I suppose one way of looking at this is that we, we, in a sense, we take out too much of the good stuff and we put, put back in too much bad stuff. So the, the oceans are a very big absorber of, of the pollution that we, provide, that we produce. Now, again, to some extent, the oceans can absorb some amount of pollution. There is a finite amount of pollution that's perfectly safe for the oceans to absorb, things like CO2, for example. But as that level goes up and up, it becomes a finite resource. And again, that's a, that's a free rider type commons problem. But it's in our interest to burn coal and to do, you know, there's a very close link to this sort of coal economy and to climate change. It's, it's very, we can gain a lot individually, whether that's the individual is at the scale of a, literally an individual or a country or whatever, you know, whatever, in, whatever unit you want to think in terms of. There's a, there's, a, um, there's a benefit to doing that, but there's also a global cost in terms of the effect it has on the oceans. So if we take that example of CO2, for example, 
the, there are huge costs to our, to our CO2 experiment we're doing in aviation. We're acidifying at a, a colossal rate. The last time they were anywhere near this, this, uh, this level of acidity was hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, and the, the tra trajectory is much, much faster than it's been in geological time. So we're doing a very dangerous experiment with this commons problem. So I think that's th th those two aspects are, are, are very clear. Um, to pick up on the sort of Ostrom type um, problem, again, it's something that's, that sort of resonates in our study as well. We have this, this, this question about how can, we, how can we manage these kinds of problems? Um, and to some extent, you can manage them in a top-down way. So uh, if you take the example of something like California, where it's a very data-rich, very well-understood, very resource-rich environment, they can afford to have a, a, a government observer on all of the federal boats. So they, they force people to follow the rules because there's a resource base that allows that. Now, if you go to another part of the world, a developing country, say Indonesia or something like this, the resources aren't available to have that kind of um, imposed structure. And so, in different, so top-down works very well where you have the resources. Top-down doesn't work at all well where you don't have the data and you don't have the capacity for enforcement. And so in, in that context, we're looking at trying to uh, do exactly the kind of thing we've just heard about, Ostrom-type work, where you say, what do you, how can you set the rules at the large scale but encourage the self-organization of some kind of um, Ostrom-like uh, governance of the commons to emerge at the lower scale? So it's a very, very interesting interplay between all these different commons problems that are all very, very closely interwoven in the, in the oceans. Um, a time dependence in that, and also a, a scale dependence and a, a, a level of development dependence. Thanks, Richard. Um, Nick. Um, thanks, Ian. So um, the, when we started thinking about um, renewable energy and uh, the commons, the, the obvious thing to think about was, was the effect of renewables in addressing climate change. I'm not going to talk about that because Cameron is, uh, but obviously energy and climate are very closely linked. But we, we hit on another, which is actually at the heart of the problem that, that I, I, I described, which is the nature of the electricity grid, which isn't normally something you'd think of as a, as a commons in that it's a, it's a human artifact, not a natural system. But it does have some of the same properties. Uh, you have to push, it, push the, the definition a little bit. So is an electricity grid um, non-excludable? Well. Yeah, because we choose to make it so, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a tenet of, of the way we run a modern society is that people should have access to electricity. And where they don't, and a billion people clearly don't, then it's a problem that we're trying to address. And it's one of the sustainable development goals, essentially, to make sure that everybody in the world has an electricity system they can't be excluded from. Um, is it rivalrous in the sense that Cameron set out well, increasingly with um, intermittent renewable energy, yes, it is. If you want to uh, put a large solar system on a roof in this city, you can't. You've been excluded from doing so because too many people have done it already or because the distribution network operator hasn't up grid, up, up, uh, increased the scale of the grid fast enough. You can, uh, you can take, you take your choice. So it's not entirely rivalrous in that sense, in that we do, because it's a technical system, we can change the technical system to accommodate more, but that's at a cost. And it has, interestingly, some of the, the, the properties that, that Richard was talking about in, in oceans in terms of, of, of effects at, at, at multiple scales. So if you're in Oxford or if you're in Cornwall, you have these problems. If you're in other parts of the country, you don't. If you're in pretty much the whole of Germany, you've got the same sort, sort, sorts of issue. And so how to govern the electricity grid at different scales becomes an issue. And we traditionally haven't done that. We've governed it at one scale. We may need to think more harder about how to govern it at multiple scales. So, do you want to say something more? Um, if you want me to. OK, yeah. briefly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to. Um, no, go ahead briefly, and I'll have one more round, then we'll open. OK. Uh, what, I mean, one of the things that I think I've already been getting out of thinking about commons problems more broadly across these domains is um, that the economic structure leads you to think about game theory, yeah, and what the incentives of the different actors are in the game that they're playing with each other. And often what you find is that a commons problem is not dissimilar to a kind of multi-person prisoner's dilemma game, which if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. Uh, <laughs> except I don't have time. Um, 
And the aim of the game here, or the aim that what we're trying to do, is design institutions, whether they're top down or bottom up, that get people together talking so that instead of playing, sorry for the jargon, but instead of playing the bad solution, playing Nash, playing defect, or telling the, your fellow prisoner, they can communicate and shift the rules of the game so that it's a coordination game so that people want to do what other people are doing. So in, in the climate space, uh, what this means is rather than everyone saying, uh, well, look, you know, uh, I'm just going to pollute because it's cheaper to do so and everyone else can bear the consequences. If you think through the, the finance sector, you think about their self-interest, you start, you can tell them, well, suppose for a moment that Paris was something, the Paris deal was something, and that it's the start of a trend and that we are going to get to, if not two degrees and certainly not four degrees. So this business as usual path that you guys have been working on is, is dead. Then the implications are that some of you are gonna lose a lot of money because if you're putting your money into new fossil investment now, it's out of budget. You know, our, our work, um, not in this particular project, but in another one shows that we're, we're out of budget for even two degrees uh, for new capital investment by the end of next year. So someone's capital is gonna to have to be stranded or they're going to have to not get their money back on it and what you can then create is a sense that well look actually everyone else in the finance community doesn't want to be financing coal anymore maybe i should be doing what they're doing because frankly there are a lot of sheep out there in the financial sector so if you can coordinate the sheep on investment in less risky non-fossil technologies uh, then the cost of capital for the fossil goes up and you end up with a self-fulfilling dynamic here where it's actually virtually impossible to make any money out of fossil fuels because the costs of investing in it are so high because it's so risky okay uh these are extraordinarily important so one of one of the things that we grapple with um a lot in these global commons issues are uh, particularly global issues like the oceans or climate change infectious diseases which uh, certainly pandemics certainly can be uh, is do you need everyone to play the game? Uh, what happens to the people uh, that don't want to be part of this? Uh, does that mean that all management of the commons is doomed to failure because you'll always have either what are called free riders uh, uh, or rogues of various types uh, who have other incentives or just don't have, uh, and particularly uh, in the development context, um, which, which I've worked on, people who might prioritize other things, like you have to get energy, so you get dirty energy, for example. Um, so uh, in thinking about this, I, I guess the, the, the final question I just want to pose before we, we open it up is, are there some actors that really matter a lot more than others um, to these solutions? Should we be focusing on particular groups? Are they governments? If so, which ones? Are they businesses? If so, which ones? Are they groups of citizens? If so, which ones? Or some coalition of these? Um, or do we really need everyone to, uh, to act to solve these problems, or at least solve most of these problems? Angela, can I start with you? All right. Um, I think there would be different answers for different questions in infectious disease control, uh, because the way, you, uh, the, the way you operate the control will affect who is really important. Uh, so I think for, um, I think for antimicrobial resistance, that is fundamentally going to be a government problem. I think we are faced with legislating our way out of that now. Um, I suppose it's conceivable that maybe some time ago we might have persuaded everybody to behave a whole lot better. But to be fair to us, I don't think it was blindingly obvious how bad it would get uh, a long time ago when, it, when, when perhaps we could have persuaded everybody, you know, these drugs are fantastically precious uh, and we should all treat them that way. And instead what we've all done is um, basically treated, treat them with the respect that, that their price would seem to apply. I, we, we treated them with no respect at all. So I think so, so. I think I'll just answer for, for that one. I think that's a government issue. Let me just um, push one step further mm -hmm. on that. Um, given its governments, 
do we want, do all governments in the world have to agree to this, or just some? I mean, I'm always struck by this number, and I'm, you know, I don't know whether it's accurate or not, uh, which is New York consumes more antibiotics than the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so are there some which are much more important that absolutely have to be part of this and others which could maybe or maybe not be part of it? That depends on the underlying biology of the pathogen in a, in a way that really requires natural science. So that, that depends on the fitness of the resistant pathogens. And one of the sort of horrible surprises of my working life has been that drug-resistant pathogens can be surprisingly fit. And sort of very simple uh, evolutionary theory says they shouldn't be, uh, but the real world says they are. And if they are, if, if they're pretty near as fit as, uh, as the wild type strains, then unfortunately everybody has to act together. Because even if, suppose, you know, suppose we, suppose we here in Oxford said, oh, well, we're going to get together and we're going to be really good, we're going to stop abusing antibiotics, we'll only use them when we really, really need them, you know, we're going to put up with a lot of unpleasantness. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, and then and then we'll just have we'll mostly have wild type strains circulating here. Unfortunately, if the antibiotic resistant strains are very nearly as fit as the wild type strains, if London is misbehaving, their horrid bugs can just come and get us too. So, uh, so I think the biology, unfortunately, in that particular case, I think the biology tends to militate against small group action. Now, I would, I would like to say, and, I, and my colleagues uh, in, in this program are probably sick of me saying that antimi antimicrobial resistance is not one problem. Uh, you know, there are many, many different bacteria. Most of the tree of life is, is bacteria. So that answer would depend upon this issue about what is the cost of resistance. Okay, let's, let's just uh, use that example for a moment. Um, do you want to give an example of, of coalitions that might or might not solve your problem? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I think the, the, the question of whether you need everyone to be involved or whether you just need to look at the key actors and, and what those coalitions might be, I think I, I'd probably answer it like this. Um, in a, I'd look at the spectrum of efficiencies, of, of the efficiencies of the actors, and I'm thinking again, our programme is quite broad, and I'm, I'm using an example of fisheries because it's a, a convenient and easy example, but this does apply to other things as well. Um, for the most efficient actors, these are the developed world um, commercial um, trawlers, for example, you really do need most of those to act together, um, and that's where things like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, up for the high, for the high seas, and other sort of regional management operations come into play. And they can be enforced to some extent from the top down. But if we go to the other end of the spectrum, the, the least, efficient, least efficient actors in the system, uh, these are in the developing world, um, but it's, it, in a sense it's where the problems are more acute. So as I was saying in the, at the beginning, um, a very large proportion of people in the developing world rely on, uh, on fish for their major protein source. Um, the numbers tell us that something like 90% of all of the fishes live in the developing world. And of those, 95% of those are small subsistence type fishes. They're not the big commercial fleets. And so we really do need to think in terms of these sort of Ostrom type, bottom up sort of type approaches where we, we don't necessarily think of the um, a coordination of absolute numbers of actors, but we think about coordination of types of actors. Um, and if we can do that, then we can maybe offset this, this sort of potential. There's lots of potential problems that stem from not solving these problems. Food security in the developing world is one of those key things. So the, the, the uh, FAO, UN FAO in 2014 had a report which said 75% uh, of fisheries in the world now are either at maximum capacity or are already in crisis. So the majority of fisheries, are, we're pushing them as, far, as hard as we possibly can and we're keeping pushing them. So there's a possi lots of fisheries in the world are very, very well managed and, and under control and recovering in, in very good shape, but a lot, an awful lot aren't. So we run the risk of, of producing a food deficit if we don't deal with these problems. So I think classifying the problems in terms of efficiency and across a developmental spectrum is a very useful way of looking at it. Nick, may, uh, maybe let me ask um, the same question in a slightly different way to you. Are there examples where you think um, integrating renewables into the grid have really addressed uh, these issues, you know, the success stories, and what and what can we learn from them in terms of the key actors uh, in making this happen? 
Yeah, I think to the level we've got so far, which is where renewables are still relatively niche in most of the world, uh, there's certainly some stories where I'd say we've got positive feedbacks uh, to, to report. Uh, Germany would be the obvious example with where their, their feed-in tariff uh, for solar was sufficiently large that it persuaded Chinese state-owned enterprises to enter the market and reduce the costs of solar. And actually, in doing so, um, through the way that the market works, in uh, it, that the power markets work, meant that, that um, fossil fuel generators operate for less of the year, so become less and less um, uh, attractive and yeah, it, look, look at where the, uh, 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 the balance sheets of the major German power generators, there's certainly been a positive feedback there. They, um, their business strategies have come through to, to, uh, to a much higher uh, emphasis on, on, on renewable energy. Whether that can work everywhere, um, I think is an open uh, is an open question, and, and at what scale to do it? Those of you pe people who came to the talk we gave will have heard Malcolm talk about fractal grids. So, what is the governance scale at which we want people to act? Is it is it the city scale? Is it the neighbourhood scale? Is it is it the global scale? How will those interact with each other? I think, to be honest, we don't know yet. Okay, which is why we're doing the research. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, it would be troubling if you knew all the answers already. <laughs> um, Cameron, uh, you, you've both got sort of the conceptual framework um, that you shared with us, as well as um, your experience now on, on getting uh, carbon out of energy systems. Um, so are they, if, 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 if we were to be successful with a small number of... Uh, this investment campaigns, for example, uh, from carbon. Can we create a cascade and suddenly it will happen? Is there, is there some strategy one can work out which you think will lead us there quicker than uh, if we just try everything all the time? Um, yes, to the second question. <laughs> uh, as you've asked, on the first question of divestment, I think the divestment campaign is itself more useful than the act of divestment. Uh, obviously, you need some acts of divestment to keep the investment d divestment campaign going. But um, yeah, if you if you actually ask yourself what divestment does, it simply shuffles ownership around and not necessarily into the good guy's hands, as it were. So um, I'm I'm not sure that divestment is the answer. And indeed, to some extent, that's why this program or this initiative, I should say, exists because the divestment movement created the space for something that was scientifically based, economically sensible, to, to come in and say, okay, there's a lot of noise, you need to do something, this is what we should do. And so that takes me to your second question, you know, do we have to do everything all the time? And I think the answer is no. You, you know, on climate, economists have said for a while, the first thing we need is not the G192 to agree, or whatever the number is these days, it's the G2. And we kind of got that initially with, with a, with a US-China deal in 2014. And I think that's why we have had a deal in 2015. We can, we can debate the pros and cons of Paris, and it's obviously not the be-all and end-all. But the fact that there was a deal is partly because we got some of the big guys lined up. And then to the point about the creative coalitions, for me, one of the most important elements of this challenge is bringing the costs down of the clean technologies. And it's staggering and, you know, just ridiculous that we've spent 10 billion-ish per annum on research and development in clean energy. Um, this is a small number, 10 billion. You compare it to many hundreds of billions on um, fossil fuel exploration, perhaps half a trillion on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, the IMF has a multi-trillion number, but that's uh, no, another debate. Uh, so 10 billion is a small number. So one of the great coalitions was that we've got mission innovation, number of small number of countries coming together to say, well, we spend most of this 10 billion in our countries, let's double it. So that 10 billion has become 20. Now, a cynic might say, well, twice of zero is still zero, but it's, it's not zero, it's just too small. And so twice of something is getting larger. But they did it jointly with the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, which is this group led by Bill Gates to mobilize private billionaires to say, well, okay, you may not need our money necessarily, but, but we bring something different, a uh, venture capital mindset that will really focus on the technologies that are gonna fly and help push the cost down as fast as possible. 
And the end of the day on climate, once clean is cheaper than dirty, we don't have a problem anymore because self-interest takes over. Great. All right, now it's time for your own self-interest to be manifest by the questions you ask. Um, this is being uh, recorded and webcast, so if you don't want to be recorded and webcast, don't ask any questions. Um, and if you want to direct them at uh, one of the particular panelists, so say uh, to who, otherwise I will um, just make up my mind to and we'll give them all a chance. Yeah, let's uh, start here. <laughs> or even new ways to fight uh, diseases or maybe some new way to get a clearer state of the, <coughs> the oceans and I don't know. So, so I'm wondering about new kind of technologies for the other problems other than the energy one we just heard. Okay. Do you want to try that as well? Yeah. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we'd all like new antibiotics. Um, the fact is, you know, the vaccines that we have are, we have these cheap, safe, effective vaccines. It's, it's not a technology problem, I think. Uh, well, that aspect is, is, is not a technology problem. I think it's, it's very interesting to think, could we use to technology to solve some of what I suspect are information problems? So my understanding is that if you look at people who are not vaccinated, they fall into two groups, really. And the big group is the people who are frankly just a bit disorganized um, and they haven't been and they're not in a system where they're getting chased very hard. So you could certainly imagine uh, some fairly straightforward technology helping to deal with that. The smaller group are in some ways more interesting and they're the free riders, they're the people who um, know that because there's, a, 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 there's enough immunity in the population that infection has become rare and they therefore choose not to vaccinate. Again, I think that's probably an information problem, because if you look at who refuses to vaccinate, that clusters too. So the honest truth is that if you pick one child uh, whose parents have, are vaccine refusers, it's very likely that that child is in a school with a lot of vaccine refusers, and then herd immunity doesn't operate. So I would like to see a situation where we use technology, or it doesn't really have to be very high-tech technology, to make it very clear to people uh, whether or not they are actually in a situation where herd immunity would be expected to operate should an outbreak occur. It'd be very interesting to see what happens then, because if they really are free riders, um, at least some of them ought to turn around and get vaccinated. Uh, so, so, yes, I think there are places where, where technology would be interesting. Oh, and and you, you, you're not saying it on terms of a new antibiotics because that would take a very long time. No, and, no, no, yeah. I think, well, no I'm, I'm not saying that because I think that's, that's uh, well, Ken already said it, it's kind of obvious. Yeah. <laughs> sure, new yeah, antibiotics would be nice. <laughs> Just difficult, yeah. Richard. Um, yes, I'm very pleased to report that the more devious of my colleagues are using technology to uh, spy on um, uh, illegal fishing from satellites and they're being even more devious by sending unmanned autonomous vehicles through the waves to uh, home in on these illegal fishes and take photographs of them and report back. And then we're trying to build the legal framework that will then allow us to do something useful with that. It's a, it's a very, very difficult legal, legal problem. Um, so there's, that's two ways in which we're using technology. Another way we're using technology is in, we've built, one of the things we're doing is to build a very um, big integrated uh, computer simulation of fisheries, ocean ecology, the market interaction and the policy imposed on that and the whole interactive system. Um, we're, we're building this model um, with, with a variety of new technological uh, improvements. We're using an agent-based model, a new sophisticated agent-based model for the fishing fleet. We're also using state-of-the-art uh, machine learning techniques to understand how that model responds to different um, externalities as well. So a whole range of different technological inputs. Okay, um, yep, the person that Carol's pointing to, <laughs> who's got the mic. Hello, I'm uh, David Calver from People and Planet. I've got a sort of two-part question. One is about incrementalism versus radical solutions. So to what extent are panel members worried we could fall into the trap of being too incremental and not doing enough to, quickly enough to solve the problems of the commons? And the second part is about uh, whether panel members are worried that sustainable solutions could be developed and we could end up in a sustainable world, but one where the only people who thrive are the ones who have power, privilege, uh, wealth, uh, and the ones who don't, the ones who don't have those things, 
which is an existing problem with the world that we currently have. So how would we foresee solutions that address that, not just getting a sustainable future, but one that actually is fair and supportive of everyone and all global citizens, rather than just the few? Who would like to go first on that? Nick or Cameron, in your terms? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there are, it, it, it's a complex issue. You can certainly see that new renewable technologies provide the potential for ac access to electricity more rapidly for the billion people who don't have it than rolling out coal-fired power stations and, and, and large grids. Uh, India's got a target to get everybody connected, 300 million people connected by the end of this decade. I'm not sure anybody thinks they'll achieve it, but it, it, you know, that's the, the way they propose to, to, to do it. At the other end of the, of the, the spectrum, it, yeah, it's, we could possibly see people using, using uh, renewable technologies to come off grid, and that would be likely to be the people who could invest in their own solar system and their own batteries. That's beginning to happen in Hawaii, parts of Australia. Um, then if that rolled out, you could see, you could get to the point, I guess, where the electricity grid system became something more like a social service uh, than a public service. So it could be for the bottom X percent. That would worry me, uh, and I think it would worry many people. So that there are some things we need to be aware of, um, and energy does have some public service characteristics as well as some, um, mar you know, some, some, some market private characteristics. Um, so on the second question, I guess I'd say I'm not sure that a highly unequal world ultimately ends up being sustainable anyway. Uh, maybe that's naive, but um, yeah, you, you probably can't keep all of the people down all the time. Uh, hopefully you can't. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so the, uh, most societies will have some degree of inequality of outcome. It's just by nature of things. But one would hope that... Uh, um, yeah, the, the, I mean, put it this way, we, we have to solve these two problems simultaneously anyway. I, I don't think you can solve the sustainability problem while failing to solve the inclusiveness uh, problem and, and vice versa. And then just quickly on the first one, incremental versus radical. Um, I think it'll be a bit of both and a bit of in various areas. I mean, if, if you think about the portfolio of strategies that you have to address any major social issue, you know, the incremental ones are probably a higher probability of paying off, perhaps lower benefit if they pay off. The radical ones are lower probability of paying off, but higher benefit if they do, whether it's, you know, radical innovation that gets solar efficiencies up to 80% or, or nuclear fusion rather than fission or whatever, you know, low probability, high payoff. So, so you, you probably want some of them in your portfolio of strategies. So I, I don't think the answer is just one or, or just the other. Um, Carol, why don't you... Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll start then. Okay, yep. Then we'll collect a few questions and then... Um, Thank you. My name is yes. Matthew Prescott. Um, I'm interested that uh, all of the areas you work in are becoming increasingly globalised the electricity sector, the finance system, medicine, fisheries. Um, can you comment on the relative roles of the, the individual, the state, and markets in addressing these uh, when they're maybe losing control in their traditional forms? OK, thank you, Matthew. Um, um, Kingsborough Bond, um, Trusted Sources. I, I, I want to pick up on what, what Professor Hepburn said um, right at the end of May. Um, he said, as soon as clean is cheaper than dirty, we'll be f free of fossil fuels. I possibly paraphrase a bit, but um, could, could it not be that actually the answer is staring us in the face? That is to say, the cost of fossil fuels could be split into two parts, the, um, the, 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 the global commerce cost and the local pollution cost. I think the IMF does a split. And, and actually, the local pollution cost may be so high in terms of healthcare and everything else that actually individual countries can and should regulate um, in, in order to take account of those costs. And, and given how close costs are already today, maybe actually the answer is already there. Um, we gradually work our way up to the front. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, David McDonald from the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, the Wild Crew. 
Uh, my colleagues and I were in the competition to which Ian alluded, a sort of pox and ass excessive, insofar as we were given a grant rather than a program, for which, by the way, we're extremely grateful. And the comments with which we are concerned is biodiversity and its conservation globally. And my question is really in that context to Cameron, who said something very interesting. Many of the problems with which we are grappling are things where it is quite clear that society and probably the environment want to change, but it's how to get there in a measured pace rather than jumping into it prematurely and counterproductively. Now, Cameron, you said uh, you phrased the question in the context of disinvestment. What is the right way to withdraw? I wondered if that's a question, because it's the one that we're tackling often, is something that has a generic answer, some general guidelines and general rules, or if it's a case-by-case -case sort of question. Thanks, David, and we're delighted that uh, we're doing this pilot program with you. So it's fantastic. Let's take one more, and then we'll come. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Bowens. Um, this question is about um, bottom-up and top-down institutions, so which are often opposed, and uh, Ostrom's approach is uh, often equated to bottom-up only uh, in institutions. But actually, she, she talked about polycentric systems. So, um, and she uh, recognized a role for top-down and bottom-up institutions. Um, polycentric systems are constituted of multiple bottom-up initiatives, but which operate under an over overarching set of rules. So there is a role for top-down institution. Wouldn't it be the way to go when it comes to design uh, proper institutions for uh, uh, managing the commons? Okay, a uh, range of questions. Um, I'll give you all a chance to respond to, uh, hopefully not all to the same question though. <laughs> Richard, you wanna go first? Um, sure, um, I, I can respond to the top down, bottom up with the, with the fisheries example. I think you're absolutely right that polycentric approaches are potentially extremely useful. And again, I'd, I'd draw on that, that uh, um, uh, comparison between more developed and more developing contexts. Um, it's one of the uh, ways in which developing world uh, fisheries have been managed that, that turns out to be quite successful in some contexts. It's been called TERFs. So the idea is that you, you hand over ownership, effective ownership, um, to some portion of the coastline to a community. It's then in their interest to manage that they give it to them and they say, okay, it's yours, you can fish it as much as you want, that's what you've got. So it's obviously in their interest to, to develop, again, in a sort of bottom up type way, to develop mechanisms for handling that problem. Um, and, and these have been very successful in some contexts and they, they, they've naturally put in um, protected reserves in some places by themselves because they realize the benefit of doing that ecologically. So it can be a very, very good um, process. It's, it's kind of partial privatization through a community. Where that breaks down is when you have the uh, kind of raider type problem. So in, in, in lots of these sort of common pool resource problems, you have a, a race to, it's called race to fish in the fishery context, but it's a race to, race, race to get stuff before other people get stuff. Now, if you know that you're, you're the only owners of that thing, it kind of stops that race to fish problem because you know it's in your interest to keep the fish in the water long enough. However, if you have a raider coming in that just scoops everything up, then it completely destroys that whole dynamic because you then want to get it before the raider comes in. And so it becomes a really difficult enforcement problem then. So, it, and that enforcement has to sometimes come from the top. So it can be that you need a, a, a mixture of these top-down and bottom-up type processes all interwoven, but they can be quite brittle systems. Uh, and I think the trick is to make them uh, adaptive enough so when conditions change, they don't collapse. I think that's one of the real tricks with lots of these sorts of systems. I'd like to address David's question about um, is it possible that there would be one set of solutions uh, that we can use in, in, in multiple, uh, for multiple questions. And, and I think in a way that's one of the things that's going on here. You'll hear us all using some similar words, referring to some similar sort of quite widespread theory. And I think our real job here, both within and between our programmes, is to really sort of think through, well, what is the what are the real details of the process we're trying to understand here that we have to get right in order to know when one solution is going to work and when we need different solutions for different bits? So I was very interested to, to hear Richard talking about enforcement. It seems to me that that's a problem uh, we share. 
and we could have a very interesting discussion at rather a high level about enforcement. And then, because we all of us also have our sort of siloed, deep expertise about one bit, also a very interesting conversation that says, oh yes, but at the end of the day, uh, stopping someone from stealing your fish is not the same um, as really uh, trying to force somebody uh, to not have antibiotics the day they want them. So I think, you, I think that's a very rich question, David, and, and, and I do honestly believe in, in a very sort of um, uh, James Martin way, I think really understanding the science uh, will help us address it better. And, and understanding consumer behaviour. Yeah. Thank you, yes, science writ large, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cameron. I might um, add to that uh, Angela's response to David and also address Kingsville's question. So, I mean, it, it, so the, the, the thing that I apparently said, which I don't deny, um, what, what, what is the right way we to withdraw? Being recorded, so we'll always check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, cameras. Um, uh, I mean, I, let me paraphrase myself and say, I guess the question here is, what, what are the dynamics of each of these problems? And what, on what time scales do we need action? And then how do we get the action on the appropriate time scale? I guess they're the questions. And um, if you think about them all, they, they're all dynamic problems. So climate is what economists think of now, thanks to Miles' work, who's sitting, Miles Allen, who's sitting at the back, uh, think of it as an exhaustible resource problem. There's a certain amount of atmospheric capability to absorb CO2. Once it's gone, it's effectively gone because the stuff stays up there for hundreds of years. So it's an exhaustible resource problem, and we need to solve the problem before we exhaust the resource. Right, so, the, so the appropriate speed is, unfortunately, given where we are now, quite fast, as I say. Uh, we have enough infrastructure, we will have enough infrastructure installed by the end of next year to have exhausted the resource. Um, that's not to say it'll be exhausted by the end of next year, but, but the kit that we've installed on Earth, if it runs for its usual length of time, will lead us to exhausting that, that stock. If you take fisheries, um, Im immunity, etc., these are what economists would think of as renewable resources, because if you uh, can manage that resource in a sustainable way, which is to say that you only take out what the resource grows at its natural rate, um, then you can run them uh, indefinitely. And biodiversity is, is another one that is, to some degree, a renewable resource. Now, it seems to me that, unfortunately, what all of our problems share is that we, we don't have the luxury of time on any of them, really, whether it's biodiversity, herd immunity, um, global fisheries, or climate. And what that then means is that you can't kind of um, you know, sit back and chill out. I mean, you, you actually have to, as I say, take uh, a portfolio approach to the, your different interventions, use, max out on technology, whether it's using for information gathering, monitoring, enforcement, understanding of the problem, highlighting free riders, et cetera, or actually providing you with a physical solutions to the problem with those new antibiotics new technologies for clean energy, new technologies for cleaner agriculture. So, so, so one of the things I think we learn from your question and the dynamics is that we have to push harder and faster on well-designed technological solutions at the same time as pushing on the socio-political and governance regime. That's probably too long an answer. Uh, quickly on Kingsbill's question. Um, look, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all, almost at parity in many parts of the world on on clean versus dirty energy. In some cases, clean is already cheaper. Once you factor in the non-global pollution externalities, you know, uh, a million people roughly die in China every year from air pollution, then you're at the point where it's a no-brainer to, to, to shift your energy system. And that's one of the things that I and many others have been saying, World Bank most recently, this is in your self-interest to do this. You don't need to be relying on others or contributing this into the global pot. Just do it because your GDP will rise, your people will stop dying, etc. And that, that applies in many countries already, but perhaps not quite all of them. Nick, um, I can't remember if there's a question we've left out. But the, <laughs> I, think, I think the first, the first, the first Matthew's question, yeah. first question on, yeah. on, 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 on globalisation. Um, uh, certainly in energy, but I suspect <laughs> from what colleagues on the panel have said in, in other areas as well about polycentric governance, I think we're moving... Uh, in contradictory directions with globalization of technology, but also more local applications, certainly in energy, 
the things we're thinking about are things like microgeneration, distributed storage, electric vehicles, much more localized approaches um, than, than we've seen historically. I suspect the two are linked through um, information, uh, the information revolution, without which everything I've been talking about wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been conceivable. Um, so I, I think that's where the notion of, of, of the importance of polycentric governance comes from, that we appear to be moving in, in, in both directions at the same time. Great, let's take a, another round. Um, right. <laughs> um, I had a question about the comment that we don't have the luxury of time that seems to me to be a common theme in these different areas, that there's a lack of long-term interest. So if you have a patient who's sick today, you're doing surgery, you know that you might cause antibiotic resistance, but you're still going to use antibiotics. If you're hungry, you're going to fish. Um, you would see that again with the finance issue. So I was wondering if you had any uh, considerations about long-term interest with these problems. Um, come on, go to Malcolm and then go back. So the, the, the question I'm asking is to say uh, a lot of the problem around the commons is that there are too many commoners. Is that a challenge that we can resolve? And, and you mean too many people in the world are engaged in these things? Um, Jake Backus from Empathy Sustainability. Perhaps a very quick answer from everybody, including you, Ian. Uh, what makes you uh, the most optimistic? Uh, what makes you the most pessimistic um, about things? And where are you net net? Um, behind you, Miles. <laughs> uh, we haven't heard of many political scientists yet, but. Um, I was just wondering if the sort of, given representative democracy seems to be rather better at managing commons problems than direct democracy, whether the panel would like to talk about the current vogue for uh, relying on referendums to make decisions in managing <laughs> commons problems. Um, okay, anyone else want to ask something? I think this will be the last round. Uh, there's a hand down here. Um, I'd just like to, to ask, uh, with the, it's a little bit related to the too many commoners idea, is that uh, whether the technology can be uh, regulated as sort of coming between the, the resource and the, um, the, the number of people that might be using it. I'm thinking, for instance, in, in antibiotics, um, whether uh, the, the number of people who use uh, pharmaceutical products are not going to be the same number as the, the number of people who are able to produce them. So there's a kind of, of a supply and a demand uh, side. And something else I, I want to also to ask is that the tragedy of the Commons situation, is, is there a, a difference that, um, between when um, someone's using a resource uh, and uh, the the, the non-conformists can um, ha have the same benefit, or is w w if they get an additional benefit if something's left, and can one um, try to influence one rather than the other? Okay, um, no one else with a pressing question? Um, so, Nick, why don't we start with you this time? Um, I'll start with the optimistic and pessimistic. Um, what I'm most optimistic about, people. What am I least optimistic about, some other people. <laughs> <laughs> um, more seriously, the time question, I think, is interesting. I mean, I've w taught students for a, a number of years that energy systems take an awful long time to turn over their infrastructure systems, multi-decadal time scales. And then we suddenly get 10 gigawatts of solar in, in, in Britain in, 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 in four years. So I think there is, it may still be that things take a long time, but there are some types of technical and social change that seem to be happening faster now. So I think it's an interesting open question in my mind. Cameron. Um, I, I remain fairly optimistic about uh, the ability of cleverly designed, human-designed technologies to help 
to reduce the challenge of the problem. The way, the way I look at it is the te technological system and the human political social systems interact. And if you get clever innovations in one system, it makes the challenges in the other system easier, potentially, in, in both. Right? Clever, uh, you know, greater recognition, recognition of the underlying structure of some of these problems and the fact that we do all have a shared interest in them being resolved. Um, you have that idea, if it can spread uh, to others, then you might change behaviours that might indeed change the amount of money going into technological development. Which, so, so there's lots of feedbacks in those two systems. So I'm optimistic that we can get some of those feedbacks working the right way. Um, are there too many commoners? Uh, there's a great group on population dynamics on there. I think I'll leave that to, <laughs> leave that to them. It's a great book, is The Planet Full. <laughs> yes, there is a great book, is The Planet Full. That's right. Uh, uh, Miles's question on representative versus direct democracy. I think there's something to be said for... So yeah, I, I'm just trying to not get myself into trouble here, but the... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and you do it Miles, so well, uh, Miles. <laughs> Miles, these are the co-directors, by the way. They, this is what we're good at. Is is uh, he gets us into trouble? I'm sure. Yeah, I know no, time we're <laughs> sparking each other to get better <laughs> ideas. Right. Um, look, I think one of the reasons, perhaps, that representative democracy may work better in these instances than direct democracy is that you have a filtering layer of people who possibly listen to the data and the science and the expertise a bit a bit more than those, I mean, let, let's put it this way. If I were to ask to cast a vote on, you know, herd immunity, I probably have nowhere near as much idea as Angela, perhaps a bit more idea than some people, but I still would consider myself unqualified to cast that vote. And yet, you know, if we go direct, then you've got 60 or 70 million people in this country casting votes on questions that actually require a lot of scientific um, background. So where that takes me is that you, you, I, I think what we want is a model, you know, other great thinkers have proposed well, well before me saying this, where you, you want the views of the public, but they have to be views that are based around the facts. So you give them a little exam, and if they fail the exam, they can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, uh, last, last quick, or short, uh, the, the long term and short term. I mean, to The Economist, this is captured by the, the discount rate question, which has been ongoing since 1930 something with Samuelson's article. Um, you know, there has been traction on this over the last 10 years since actually the pioneering UK Green Book amendments in 2003 in the UK Treasury. Other countries around the world have adopted those amendments. What they basically do is force government to place greater weight on the distant future than on the immediate present. Now, what you're probably not going to do is enable individuals to shift their own internal discounting functions. We're all going to be impatient and want stuff today rather than tomorrow. But what I think you can do is help people understand that um, that there is this present bias, is what's called in literature, uh, and that uh, part of the key to success for most human beings in some form or another is finding mechanisms to commit yourself to doing stuff that you really don't want to do, but you know it's in your own interests to do. Certainly, if I didn't have these mechanisms, I'd never get anything done. You know, So uh, more widespread use of uh, an understanding of personal commitment mechanisms can can shift the behaviour so you get the long-term personal outcomes you want. And we can think of them, about them at the social level as well. Thank you. Um, Richard. Yeah. Um, so I can answer the, the long-term interest question and the too many people, uh, too many commoners question. In, uh, yes, there are too many uh, commoners as far as I'm concerned in the oceans. It's one of the huge problems and one of the ongoing problems that, that's so difficult to, to, to deal with is there are just too many boats catching too many fish. Um, and one of the difficulties then is that people get locked into this with the stranded assets type arguments. Um, it's very difficult to get out. You become dependent on this um, system that eventually leads to a, something like a subsistence, low profit sort of scenario. It's very, very difficult. So one of the, one of the big problems that we're facing is how to reduce um, N down to something manageable. That, that's one of the big problems. Um, in terms of uh, optimism and pessimism, um, I'm most pessimistic uh, in terms of the oceans. Um, uh, it can be Romsfeldian for a moment, and it's the unknown unknowns. Um, so 
the, the whole notion of a potential cascading collapse. So in lots of, lots of systems that are highly coupled, if one domino falls over, it tips another one over, and that tips another one over. We don't really know what those synergistic effects are between different parts of the system well enough. We don't know how strongly they're coupled. We don't know how close one system is. And if that tips over, if some small thing happens somewhere, and it depends on how that's connected and how strongly that's connected to something else. And it depends then on the, on the network of those connections. If there's enough critical connections connected up and the network of those critical connections is right, then the whole system can collapse. And there are lots of successful models of these sorts of systems for earthquakes and for a whole range of different things. But if it's one of those cascading type systems, then that's absolutely terrifying because the implications of a cascading collapse through ecological systems in the oceans is, is, is horrible. We do have evidence of that happening locally and changes in state from one stable condition to another stable condition where one is what you would want and one is what you wouldn't want. And there are lots of examples of that around the world on a small scale. My fear is that those things would connect up. That's, that's a horrible thought. Um, I'm most optimistic, I think, um, that there is a genuine desire to solve these problems. And that's expressed in lots of, lots of, on lots of scales from individuals that I talk to all the way up to places like the UN, which are now recognising there's a, a negotiation going on for a re, uh, renegotiation for implementing the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which recognises the need to protect biodiversity, to protect the genetic inheritance of these oceans for the common good. All of these very, very, very um, useful uh, uh, ideas. Um, so that gives me great hope that there is genuine interest in doing this, and it's, it's expressed at lots of different scales of society. So there is some hope, and there's lots of, there is some good news around it. Angela. If I get the last word, so I'm going to use I'll my last, um, Ian's going to have the last word. <laughs> I'm use my last word to answer the optimistic, pessimistic question. It's such a great question. I'm profoundly optimistic. And you only have to look at under five mortality and how it's changed over the last 15 to 20 years. Large swathes of the, of, of the world under five mortality is just melting away. Uh, and, that, and that's fundamentally because of technologies of, of various different kinds. Uh, and a lot of that is from controlling infectious disease. And I think there's no question that we've made enormous, enormous strides really quite recently. And yes, there are problems that have to be overcome, but I see no reason to think that, that those, those great improvements won't continue. So I'm fundamentally optimistic about that. Pessimistic, I think people who worry about antimicrobial resistance, about antibiotic resistance in particular, are right too. I think the problems with extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis are really worrying. Um, Net, definitely optimistic, um, but unfortunately not necessarily uh, because of anything I know. I think I was just born that way. <laughs> <laughs> Optimism of the world, pessimism of the intellect. Um, so uh, let me try and pull some of these pieces together and also um, ask the question that was, ask the question that was, was posed. Um, you know, this was the f last week, was the first week since 1823. Uh, that the UK operated without coal, and uh, incidentally, so did Portugal. Uh, that is amazing. I mean, I would never have dreamed that would have happened so quickly. Uh, and um, there are many things that happen quickly. Uh, Angela's pointed to another, this improvement in uh, life expectancy and decline in infant mortality. Both the technologies, but I think more fundamental than the technologies is the ideas. The movement of ideas around the world in new ways. Three billion more literate people in the world over the last 30 years. Uh, they are the commons. Knowledge is also a commons. And so what we don't have enough of actually is the knowledge commons. Uh, that is the most powerful reason to be optimistic. Uh, the collective brain power to solve problems. And um, of course knowledge can also be used to create immense harm as uh, some uh, competing ideologies uh, want to do uh, in not only jihadist but uh, in the US and elsewhere. So that's why uh, it is a contest, I think, and why it's so important. But if you want to be optimistic, uh, you can just look at the collective brain power of the world that's being switched on. Uh, and not least uh, the Oxford Martin School capacity, I think, to try and bring these together. That makes me incredibly optimistic. Uh, it's, the, it's really the gulf between knowledge and action that makes me pessimistic. Uh, we understand the future better than we ever have, and we understand the consequences of our actions better than we ever have, whether it's antimicrobial resistance or climate change or oceans uh, or anything. Uh, we know more. 
uh, and we know more what to be done. The problem is short-termism in, uh, in not only, I think, uh, in economics uh, or in, um, I'm, I think Cameron, you're optimistic to think that governments have become more long-term. Uh, the Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations suggests that they're becoming much more short-term. Uh, and then you get into, I think, the, the, the question that, that Miles uh, sort of was pointing to, but I think a broader one, which is, are democracies getting bigger, better or worse at handling these, these challenges? So we need to, we need to uh, be much more active, uh, those of us that know about um, these issues. And the role of science uh, in informing debate, I think, is more important. Uh, than ever, as is uh, interdisciplinary thinking. So Oxford Martin School is a huge source of optimism. Today is a rather significant day for me because we have a short seminar series this term because of exams. Uh, and it's actually the last thing I'm going to be chairing as director in the Oxford Martin School after chairing over 100 events. I'm stepping down as director at the end of this term. Achim Steiner will be up here uh, in September or October when we come back chairing events. I'll be in the back of the audience. Uh, when I come back from my sabbatical, uh, which I'm looking forward to. But I do want to take this occasion to thank you all for coming. Keep coming. Uh, the school will continue to grow to even higher levels, and it's because of the people that are on my left and right, the brain power uh, that we are bringing together that it makes it so exciting. But I also do want to take this occasion to thank those that make these events happen. Uh, Caroline, Clara, Carol, Sally, Anusha, Julian, and all my colleagues. Uh, that are here, it's not in the back and you can't see them, uh, who are uh, making these events happen. So it's, it's really been, uh, I think, extraordinary uh, what they've done and what people around the school are doing and what you're doing by coming. So keep up the good work and uh, I'll see you. Uh, and I'll be more relaxed in future. So I won't be <laughs> running to another meeting. Thanks very much. <laughs>